Lovely. Welcome back, everyone. Getting ready to go again for the last talk before we head into the lightning talks after afternoon tea. So we have Dave Airley, who's actually a local. He's in Brisbane. He works on the graphics in the Linux kernel. And today, he's here to tell us about TensorFlow on open source GPU stack. Hi, I, uh, as I said, I'm Dave Early. I work at Red Hat in Brisbane. I've been, this is my 11th presentation at LCA I looked at this morning. Out of 14, the three gaps were as I had children, every one of those gaps, so I haven't missed one for any bad reasons. Um, and my talk today is TensorFlow on open source GPU stacks. Uh, the talk's a little bit of a, an SEO hook I've discovered because last year I gave a talk with CUDA in the title and then I looked at the YouTube hits the other day and it was like I got 42,000. I went, whoa, that's a way a lot of hits. I must have, I had accidentally SEO'd my title last year. So this year I'm going to experiment and SEO'd it a bit this year. So, <laughs> so my talk's in kind of two parts. The first is like a bit of a technology overview of the area. It'll take into what, you know, what TensorFlow and those things are and what I'm going to use them for. And, the second part is going to be more about Mesa and runtime and what, what's actually happening in the Linux open source world that will enable these technologies. So um, let's get into the first one. So TensorFlow, hands up who's heard of TensorFlow. Yeah, probably should have gone the other way and said who hasn't heard of TensorFlow. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of these technologies that's come along for machine learning. It's, you know, it, it's not ubiquitous, but it's pretty common. Uh, there's a couple of others like PyTorch and stuff. But TensorFlow is, is the one you hear about a lot. And when people come to us as a company at Red Hat, you hear TensorFlow being the thing they want to run. And so it's like, OK. And so TensorFlow can run on your CPU. And that's fine. You can build it and run your CPU. But you know, CPUs aren't that good at this. So it can run really well on your GPU. And I do GPUs, so this is interesting. But unfortunately, TensorFlow as is now, if you want to run on your GPU, only it works with CUDA. And as everyone knows, if you want to use CUDA, you've got to use the NVIDIA binary stack and all that entails and all the pain and support. And you, yeah, you pretty much supporting it is hard, doing anything with it is hard. Yeah, so people are using it, but personally, I wouldn't want to recommend to someone to use that. And it's not really compatible with this, you know, the audience of this conference. They're probably in that I'd rather not use it category. Uh, just a little aside, there is a another project called TensorFlow Lite, which is in the same uh, ecosystem. It's more of an IoT-focused thing. It runs with, it has actually more GPU backends, like it can run on GLES, Metal, OpenCL. There isn't a Vulkan backend yet, but I can't see there not being one, considering Google really want to get this running on Android, and Android is Vulkan. So it's a little aside, but it's not the main TensorFlow, because I come from more of an enterprise area. When people say TensorFlow to me, they mean the big heavyweight one. The, the bigger product, project. So what's the, one of the problems with TensorFlow as well is if you ever actually checked out the repo and looked at it, is there's a lot of components. It's got a lot of third-party software inside in it. Uh, just some examples of that. So uh, Eigen is probably one of the biggest third-party pieces of code that's inside TensorFlow. So it's a separate project. Um, it's like a C++ templating library. It does like linear algebra, matrices, vectors, solvers. It's got a whole lot of useful things that you would want. Um, and it's one of the also uses CUDA in a large way. So again, well, to get TensorFlow working, first you've got to get Eigen working. So it's like move down the stack. There's also a couple of other sets of libraries you sort of standardly get, like a BLAS, which is like a linear algebra libraries, and DNN, which is like neural network to expert libraries. So these, these things come from the GPU vendor. So NVIDIA have these, and they come with CUDA. And you can get them from other places, but you have to optimize them for your graphics card. And it's, you know, it's a bit of a, how do I find this? So we have all these components. We want to run them on an open source stack. Well, let's see what sort of, what does the stack actually even look like, closed or open? Well, the first part of the stack is the building part. It's like I want to take some application source, be it Eigen or TensorFlow source code, and I want to build it into something I can run on my graphics card, or on my, well, actually on my CPU that uses my graphics card. Um, the two sort of, from my point of view, sort of important pieces of that are the application source code. So what do I write my application in that enables me to do this? And the IR binary that gets, produ that gets produced and put into the executable. It's like, so what sort of code do I now have that I have to execute on the graphics card when, when the compiler is finished? If you're using CUDA, the top yellow box application source is CUDA. 
and the IR binary other box is PTX, if, you, if you're familiar with that stack. And the way it works is then you've built all that into your executable and you have to run your executable. But if we're going to step back and want to re replace CUDA with something, we need to put our own things in these yellow boxes. You know, the other stuff is device compilers and stuff. That's mainly an LLVM thing for a lot of people. And the host compilers, your GCC or CLang. So the really the big things we need to focus on, first of all, is how do we get people to write applications using our stack? And how do we then push stuff out the end of the stack that we can give into you know, a runtime later? How do we ship it, I suppose? So the first replacement that is sort of being brought out is this thing called, I have to remember to pronounce it, it's sickle. Because I keep saying it wrong and people tell me, no, it's pronounced sickle. Uh, it's a single source language like CUDA. You write your code for your graphics card and your CPU all in one place. It's C++ templating. And it's, it, yeah, it, it, it's what you want to do if you're actually writing something like TensorFlow or Eigen. It's the sort of language you want to use to do that, that sort of process. Um, the initial spec was released at 1.2.1, 1. 1 was released recently, probably a year ago now. Um, it's not complete, but it's a good basis to start building the, the more things on. It's run by the Kronos group, so the same people that do standardization like OpenCL and uh, Vulkan, OpenGL. They're the same people that are doing this. Um, Cycle then, when you want to run it later, will run on sort of different backends. So it, initially, Cycle has been tied to OpenCL, but there's been talk of making Cycle more executable on other things. So this this is the language you want to be writing your source code in to use these things. So to get TensorFlow on an open source stack, first of all, you've got to port it to Cycle. Now, Eigen then has to be ported to Cycle. Uh, you need a Cycle Blast library, a DNN library that's Cycle-based. So all those components and things have to get ported over. Um, so far, Eigen just got a Cycle backend that works in its Git tree. It was in, also another problem with, with Eigen was it was in Mercurial until about a month ago. So it made it extra fun to try and deal with. Um, but now it's in Git, and they've just merged the backend. So TensorFlow backend is in progress, but the Eigen one is mostly there. And then the other end of this is what do we store in the binary? What's going to go into the binary that we ship to users that then they have to run on their systems? If this was an NVIDIA situation, you'd have a big lunk of PTX assembly in your, or P PTX IR in your, in your binary. That's not an open standard. You don't want PTX IR in your binary if you're doing an open source stack because you don't control it. You have no way of creating a, you know, adding things to it. So the Kronos group again started a standard called Spear a while back. And then they realized that was a mistake, and then they called one called Spear V, which was, I'm not sure whether the V is five or whether it's just something else Vul it, for Vulcan or not. They, they weren't great in the naming back then. Um, but what is Spear V? Spear V was a standard IR between the front end of the compiler system, so what you're building into your binaries, and then the back end where you're actually executing them. Uh, it's roughly like, sort of like the LLVM IR in terms of what it supports, but it's not actually encoded like LLVM IR, which is what Spear did wrong in the first place. But when you hear the term Spear V, unfortunately, it's not sufficient to describe what you're getting. There's two forms of Spear V. There is a shader form and a kernel form. Now, I'll get to these in a second, but it's important that if you ever see somebody saying something targets Spear V, that you will, is it targeting shader Spear V or kernel Spear V? Because they are very different. Uh, like they're, they're the same encoding, but the, what they actually encode is quite a different program. And they, you cannot e execute a shader Spear V on top of uh, kernel runtime. You cannot do vice versa. Um, the Spear V uh, code is just like a binary encoded thing. That gets passed into the backend compiler, and that's what optimizes it. So that, that all happens at runtime. You up, do all the optimizations. So just to give a bit of a put, so now you've got the execution stack. So you've built your binary. You've got your Spear V inside in your, your binary, and you're ready to like actually run it. Well, I have to run it on top of something. There has to be an execution time, runtime stack for me to take that Spear V and give it to my graphics card. Well, how do I do that? Again, there's a picture that's got the application. There's some support libraries. Then there's the runtime. There's the kernel driver. And there's GPU hardware. Again, the runtime is the bit I'm sort of focused on here. It's the bit that, need, that would changes the most. So CUDA has its own runtime. So you'll see that you, 
that's when you run something with CUDA, it launches, it links to a lib CUDA library that then actually sends it down to the graphics card and does all the work. So we would need to replace this in this or create our own one in this. Um, so the execution environment has the compiler for the graphic card in it, pretty much. It, it seems a bit strange that you have another compiler. They call it a finalizer in a lot of places, but it really is just another compiler that converts the spear V that you got from the binary into GPU assembly and GPU binary and then sends it down to the card. And that is a full compiler. It has got all of the features you need, all of the optimization passes. It has to do a lot of, so it's not, it's not a trivial thing. And another area that happens with execution is memory management area. So you need to be able to give memory to the program that's running from the graphics card. You need to be able to you know, allocate memory, move memory around, copy it between video RAM and main RAM, and all the sort of things that graphics cards need to do. And there's a bit of a case called shared virtual memory, which is this feature where, OK, if, one problem when you have is when you're programming on graphics cards is I've got this program. I have to allocate some memory. You allocate the memory on the video card. You then copy stuff into that and then tell it to use it. But you have to explicitly allocate memory on the video card. And that's fine if you heard a known advance what's happening. But if you are streaming in large amounts of data or you've got data that has things like linked lists in it where you can't really follow a linked list if you have to copy individual pieces. You, you, start, you sort of end up realizing you need the same set of pointers on your graphics card and on your CPU side. And this is where this term shared virtual memory comes in. It means that your program can execute. And when it follows a pointer, it can be in the graphics card or it can be on the CPU. And the paging will happen and all the magic stuff will happen behind the scenes. And your data will appear where it needs to appear. And it'll all just work. And I'll, I'll get into why this is a bit of a, it sounds like a really cool feature to have, but it's a bit, bit of a tricky thing. But where it's really coming into people want it is, of course, linked lists and pointer following. So I'll talk about that in terms of what have we got out there that we could use as an execution environment for our cycle binary that we've created, our Spear V binaries. OpenCL. This is a Kronos standard. Its logo, logo is not a Kronos logo, as you can tell, because it doesn't have a big swipey thing around it. But it's because Apple created the logo before they gave it, and nobody wants to touch it anymore. Um, cycle, or, or sorry, Sickle originally started with its backend target at OpenCL 1.2 uh, with a Spear V extension. OpenCL, it's had some problems in its, in its time. So it came from Apple got given the Kronos, produced a couple of standards, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. Everyone was implementing it. Everyone was implementing it. 1.2 came out. 2.0 was released, and NVIDIA didn't implement it, and still happened. And uh, everyone went, oh, that's kind of annoying. But one of the problems was when they got to doing 2.0, 2.1, they turned them into a bit of what I call a kitchen sink. They threw stuff into the standards. It's like, we need this feature. Everyone's features get in. But they didn't validate any of this. They didn't sit down and go, hey, can I even actually implement this? No, 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 we're just fine. Throw it in there. Someone will implement it later. And one of the features they added to the spec in OpenCL 2.0 was shared virtual memory, SVM support. But none of the graphics hardware supported this at the time. And X number of years later, like three, four, five, while they continually iterated graphics cards, trying to fix it, like your graphics card from maybe eight years ago may have had the initial version of this, but they've been slowly getting it there. And I think the last sort of sets of graphics cards that have come out, maybe the last two, finally can support this feature. But for supporting it exactly like it was in the spec, kind of tricky. So maybe NVIDIA were right in not pushing forward on it until they could prove it. And I think that was their grounds. But so it sort of has, we have this OpenCL thing. It's stagnated. It's kind of old. It's a more of a high-level API like OpenGL. Um, and yeah, so I'm not saying it, it's not going to come back. It, they could rescue it, but they need to really turn the ship onto realizing what people need for the future. They need to be able to say it's just a Spear V execution environment. It's SVM is spec like it should work. We just forget all about that. So hopefully there's some development from these guys in the next while. I'm, like I'm in the standards body, but I don't spend a lot of time in their meetings. I should probably spend more. Uh, so another option if we wanted an execution environment, is Vulkan. Anyone who's 
been here for a few years. I was trying to probably like four years ago I talked about Vulkan, uh, maybe three. Uh, so Vulkan is a graphics API that was produced by the Kronos Group. It came from AMD originally, it's Mantle. It was given to the Kronos Group. We all, everyone took it on and jumped into it and created it. Good. And it's a, uh, I have to say I've been working with it for a few years and I've, it is a, it's a good low level API. So as opposed to OpenGL where you're very far away from the hardware, Vulkan's a lot closer to the metal. So when you write something in Vulkan, the, the distance from API to hardware is very small. As opposed to OpenGL, when you do something at the API, it's probably going to go through five or six layers of it, things before it actually gets put into by the hardware. So it's, it's a, the new wave of APIs. They got too complicated. We need to start again from scratch at a low level. So Vulkan is good. Vulkan has the ability to run compute shaders. Now, I'll mention this in a bit more. But it's very graphics focused. These guys wrote this to replace OpenGL. Everyone involved in is, an, is a graphics person. Like, so they, they can do compute, but whether they are motivated to provide all the features that Sickle needs in a time frame that Sickle can use them is unfortunately a bit questionable. That's a bit of an open question. And we, because they have other, their priority is not compute. Their priority is still graphics. Uh, if anyone follows this stuff, Vulkan 1.2 was released yesterday. Uh, which is good because I got to include it in my talk because it's been coming for a while. Uh, it added a, a bunch of features again for graphics and some stuff for compute. Uh, one, of the, one of the things Vulkan does really well that OpenCL does, didn't do is that they insist on having two implementations of every feature for every extension that goes into the stack and they insist before it gets ratified by the, the board that the compliance test suite is in place. So. You have two, two separate, and, that, and that's good. This stops the kitchen sink mentality. It stops the, we'll throw it in and we'll figure it out later. Um, unfortunately, it also has the disadvantage it slows you down. So if you suddenly want to add compute features and there's a delta between what you want and what you need and it's like 10 features wide, you're going to have to iterate over those 10 features, get buy-in from everyone, and it, the process can take a little while. And if you wanted to ship a product tomorrow, yeah, it's probably not the ideal solution, but so I'm just going to give a little small divergence. So that on the execution model, again, what I mentioned earlier, shader versus kernel. Vulkan has a shader execution model. OpenCL has a kernel execution model. It's not the Linux kernel. It's just what they call graphics programs at this level. Um, what does that actually mean? The way graphics, if you ever wrote OpenGL, or if you've ever written Vulkan, or you've ever seen a shader, you give a shader a list of like images, a list of buffers, a list of uh, uh, there's different types of buffers, there's lists of constants. There's a bunch of resources that a shader can access, and you can give it to it in a table, and it's got this fancy binding system where it binds all of them into it. It doesn't look like a function call. It's not like you're just calling a function call. Whereas a kernel execution environment has more of a, I'm going to call, uh, give you a function and I'm going to give you all the inputs to the function. So you can pass in like a, a, a bit number, a pointer, followed by an image pointer, followed by a buffer pointer, followed by another pointer. It can be, you know, it's not as, uh, it's more like a, a programming language is than the shader model is. Also, the OpenCL people over the years with the kernel model have added a lot of features for a lot of, I won't say niche hardware, but that may not be as broadly useful as you'd like. So they, for instance, when you do graphics, you've got vectors of 1, 2, 4. But you do OpenCL, you've got vectors of 8 and 16. Not sure what 8 and 16 are always useful for, but some hardware must have them at some level so they're in the spec. Um, you do graphic shaders, you get a bunch of like maths functions and sort of useful maths functions. They're not always specified so well. There's a lot of leeway given to graphic shaders because faster is better than accurate in a lot of cases. They don't really care about what's on the screen being perfect as much as they care about you getting to the, to the faster, but compute people seem to care about the results. I don't know why. It's like they like the numbers that come out at the end to be the same numbers that come out at the end of every other time they've done a compute calculation. Strange people, I'm not sure what they came from. But because of this, the kernel has a, the, 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 the execution model for compute has a lot more maths functions 
And it has duplicates of lots of maths functions, which are called the fast versions, which bypass all the good stuff and go straight down to the hardware. So it's, it's a bit more. So you see, if, if you're doing Vulkan and you want to use these compute shaders, you're going to have to start moving all of these features that are currently missing from Vulkan and adding them one by one and getting them through the process. So like one, you would spend two months on VEC 816. You'd probably spend two months on adding the, um, uh, I've lost my, which one of the other, like some of the other features. There's so many little small changes that you have to add to the spec. Everyone then will have to go through two implementations CTS, which will be a good thing, but it's a long thing. It takes a lot of time. And we, they've added a bunch of things to graphic shaders already. Like you pretty much nearly have pointers now, which you didn't have at the start of Vulkan, but Vulkan 1.1 added some of them. And you have. I think pointers are the main big thing they've added. Oh, also 8-bit and 16-bit ints and floats, because graphics cards were always 32-bit's good, maybe 64-bit, but now somebody's like, no, no, we need 8 and 16-bit, so they've all been pushed in as well. So there's this delta between Vulkan is the API you might want at your, at your runtime, but it doesn't have the features. OpenCL is the API you probably didn't want, but it has all the features. How do we move forward, where do we go? La up on the last year, when I, I think I gave a talk in the series last year, yeah, it was very open. It was no, no one had sort of declared any intent in this area. But about a month ago, or whatever supercomputing was last year, supercomputing 2019, Intel decloaked their one API initiative, which <laughs> Keith will soon be laughing, because it is, he has worked there. But it is a, it's, on paper, it's a really nice idea. It may not be, it may, we may never see it, but a, the idea is a good idea. They had this idea that, well, the world is getting like, more complicated from a point of view of CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs. Let's try and bring some sort of binding to all of this that we can create like, programs that can be run on FPGAs, can be run on GPUs, can be run on CPUs, or can be, and can do this yeah, a bit more freely. You know, there's always going to be tuning, but can we at least program it all in the same language and tune the result or tune the inputs? But let's not have a separate language for writing all of these things. So that's kind of the basis of their one API. But one API is a lot bigger than that. It's got all of those support libraries. It's got the Blast, the DNNs. Some of it's open source. Some of it's not open source yet, some of it's closed source, never know if it's going to be open source. So there's a lot of bits to it that you have to encompass. And it works on Windows, it works on Linux, it's like, so it's a huge project. And it's ostensibly to support their new discrete graphics chip when it comes out. Unknown when, that com when it's going to ship, but they are creating a, that bit's public. They are creating a discrete graphics chip, and this is how they want to support it for use by people. It's, it's their CUDA challenge. And we can only hope that Intel keep going with it. You know, we, we have history in both departments, so it's, we'll see what happens. But um, what does this bring to my problem? Like, how, how will this help me get my TensorFlow going on my open source GPU stack? Well, there's so two sort of big things they've done in this. The first is they've come up with this thing that they call Data Parallel C++. But it's really just Sickle. It's Sickle with a few more extensions that they realized that would be really useful to have to make C++ Sickle work better on their FPGAs and possibly on their discrete GPUs. We don't know that because they haven't given us any information on the discrete GPUs. But they do have this running on their current GPUs. So you know, on your integrated Skylake and above. So there is support. So yeah, this is pretty much, they've produced a compiler that is LLVM based that takes DPC++, but Sickle as input, and produces a Spear V binary at the back end. So this pretty much covers that whole building slide that I wanted. It's like this project, as long as it keeps going and gets upstreamed into LLVM, eventually LLVM will cover that side of my problem. How do I build this into a binary? It will, there will be an LLVM compiler that takes Sickle, produces a Spear V binary, and then I'll, I'll have to figure out how to run it. And that's good. I, so. Hopefully this keeps going. It's, it's early days, but they seem to be making the right noises. Everyone that's involved in Sickle is happy about it, which is a good thing. So that solves my how do I build it, but how do I run it? They created an API that, because it's called one API, 
Well, the other API has to be the zero, so it's called level zero. And this is the runtime API that they've produced. This API sits pretty much at the Vulkan level. It's low level. It's not like OpenCL. There's no, it's pretty much to the hardware. Uh, it has SVM support, but SVM support is optional and conforms to how the hardware works as opposed to you know, what it should what we thought it might look like. Um, so it, yeah, this seems like something I, I should want. It's a Vulkan-like OpenCL replacement. My first question upon hearing about this and then when it became public, so the, the API, this spec for this API is public right now. If you type level zero, one API level zero in, you'll find a link to the spec, all of the information on how to use it. Um, there is no implementation of this public yet. And I have no knowledge or I can mention of any of when it will land. But hopefully in the next few months, there might be an imp a sample implementation released. But again, why is this not Vulkan? Like, why not just create a Vulkan extension that just adds all the features you wanted for level zero, and then you just have Vulkan as your execution? I haven't got a good real answer to that yet. I think the, the, the answers I've been given have been mostly Politically, you know, oh, well, we need it for something else. FPGAs need it. Those FPGA guys have never heard of Vulkan. We don't want to land them with a graphics like thing. And, but the, there was plenty of scope to make this Vulkan light, like remove all the graphics stuff from Vulkan. Like Vulkan's spec is completely open source. You can rip the spec to pieces and, you know, re edit it and reproduce your own versions of it. And so they could have just taken it, cut all the bits out, added the things they needed, and made a Vulkan compute spec. So it, it, it seems to be sort of semi-political, semi-technical. Maybe someone was getting a good promotion. We don't know. We don't get that sort of insight. But this exists now. It does what I want. Should this be the thing? So I'm just, this, I'll just throw it out. So that's sort of the technology overview part of the, the talk. That's sort of what the current state of where things have happened. I said, this is very new. This is, I only got looking at this about a month ago. Uh, so it, we'll see how it goes over the next year. But in terms of how is the open source stack going to handle this, um, so the open source user space for this stuff is Mesa. That's what we all use for OpenGL. I think we'd sort of like to think of the Mesa project not so much as an OpenGL driver project or a Vulkan driver project. It's more of a building blocks project for writing GPU drivers. It's not, it, it, there's a lot of helpers and a lot of functionality in there that even if you're writing a driver for like an old OpenGL, this is going to save you so much time. You know, you have proprietary people who must be crazy not using it. Because it's under the MIT license, so you're even doubly crazy to not using it. Um, so what does Mesa have now? Well, for, first thing it has for my project is it does Spear V. So it can take a Spear V code and it can parse it. And it can parse shader Spear V really well because we have a Vulkan and OpenGL Spear V backend. Kernel Spear V. Yeah, we're working on it. My, there's myself and another guy at Red Hat who are actually putting time into getting that working. And I've just remembered the thing I didn't I forgot earlier. One other difference between shader and kernel and Spear V is if you're into, anyone knows about flow control and CFGs and the flow graph, you know, how, how compilers do flow control, you have unstructured and structured flow control. Shader is very structured. Graphics cards really like structured flow control. That's their, they're one of their things. LLVM produces unstructured flow control. So the kernel version of Spear V allows for unstructured flow control. And our Spear V parser is very, I want my structure, structure's good. So we, one of the big projects has been how do we deal with that unstructured to structured transition. There's lots of papers about how to do it and how it should work, but it's not a trivial thing. You have to, it's, a, it's a very deep compiler and IR thing. So that's probably one of the, p the pieces that's currently missing, but we're working on. Um, but what else has Mesa got for us? It's got Near. Near is a middle IR. So Spear V get, is Spear V is not really something you want to optimize. It's something you translate into Near, and then we do all our optimizations in Near, and then it gets passed to each graphics card. And every graphics card has its own backend compiler that comes out of Near. So that's like, well, we're doing this for graphics. Surely the same compiler should be good for compute because it's still targeting the same hardware. We still want the same, you know, output at the end to be something that runs on a GPU. We're trying to get people to believe this, of course, because a lot of people have come with LLVM is, of course, the best compiler for everything, but LLVM is not a great compiler for graphics cards. They kind of, they don't really 
care about graphics cards enough for their compiler to be a good compiler. They, you, you, you know, if they have a decision to make in their, the depths of their compiler, they're not going to make it on behalf of graphics cards over CPUs. So a lot of the trade-offs, when you put stuff in, you lose data in the middle in the optimization passage you need it at the end, you can't find it. So LVM is not the right answer. We believe that NIR is a better toolbox for writing graphics, you know, producing, for producing code for graphics cards. Um, other features that Mesa has, it's got an abstraction layer for drivers called Gallium, which lets you sort of write one driver for GL and use that same driver for OpenCL. Um, nearly all the drivers have sort of moved towards that abstraction layer, but Vulkan drivers don't actually use the abstraction layer because Vulkan is actually lower than the abstraction layer. It has its own low-level low APIs. But all the Vulkan drivers share all their compiler code with all the other drivers. They share all their image handling code with all the other drivers. Like, so there's quite a lot of sharing of code between all the levels of drivers. So it's a, as I said, it's more like a toolbox than it is uh, how to write a driver, or how, it just specifically for writing graphics drivers. So I need to get Mesa. <laughs> to a place where TensorFlow can run something on it, because that is the point of my talk. But I had one of these. This is not man in the middle. And I think most people here have hopefully seen this, because I can't show it. It's Malcolm in the middle. If anyone's ever seen the episode of Malcolm in the middle where Hal goes to fix a light bulb, <laughs> and then he gets a shelf to fix, and then he has to get oil to fix the shelf, and then he has to go to the store to buy the oil, and then he goes to turn on his car, and his car's not working, and then his wife comes in and goes, are you fixing that light bulb? And he's under the car with the engine block out going, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's what sort of happened with this. So when I talk to you for the next few minutes about what I've been doing, I am actually getting TensorFlow to run on me. So <laughs> you just might not believe me. Um, so yeah. The main thing we sort of decided was, well, let's just get OpenCL running about a year. I was like, well, even if it's not what we want, it's at least a good stepping stone. And all the work we do underneath OpenCL, we can pivot that towards whatever API we eventually use. Even if we just add Vulkan extensions or whatever we do, all the compiler works the same work. A lot of the runtime work is all the same work. Some of the tests we can, re we can retarget to a new API pretty easily, the test frameworks and stuff. So let's you know, start with that. And now my brain went, OK, that's nice, but I'd like to be able to like, have some sort of way of testing this on my computer without my graphics card you know, and doing CI, because one of the problems with doing CI is there's very rarely a graphics card involved. And I'd like to be able to run this on, my, you know, on GitLab, which we use for all Mesa development, and have you know, regression testing and all those features that we all like. So I was like, well, like, see how we could do this. So that, I'll get into what happened there. So first of all, Mesa OpenCL, how did, what had we? We had a project called Clover. This was the Mesa OpenCL abstraction layer. It was written by AMD, started by AMD and a couple of other people. AMD abandoned it about four or five years ago and moved all their work to the, their own Rock'em stack, which is like CUDA, but here's some source code we throw over the wall every few weeks. Um, but Clover never really got OpenCL done. It was always this, well, we kind of have it done. Why, why, why is it working? How hard? And no one could implement it for anything but AMD. It was really tied into how their LLVM pieces worked. And it was, there was very little abstraction between how do I, the driver, once you had the OpenCL code you put in, it ran through the LLVM side and never came back into the Mesa side. It was just, it was very hard to plug anything else in but the AMD driver. And the reason, one of the reasons that was was there was no IR at the time that you could use to put in. But Spear V came out. And suddenly, well, actually, Spear V is a good, it makes writing Clover a lot more sane because you abstract away all the higher level parts of OpenCL into the LLVM part, and then you produce Spear V, and then you get all the driver code down below that turns the Spear V into the hardware. Um, so, but now we was like, okay, well, we can probably push this forward. So myself and one other guy at Red Hat have been trying to move the OpenCL support forward. As I said, the structured versus unstructured flow control is a big area that we have to get working for the Spear V to actually be useful. OpenCL 1.2 conformance we have to get. Somebody decided that adding printf to graphics cards made sense. Uh, yeah, it does, but it's really messy to actually work, make work. And OpenCL, I said, has a way more, because this area has got like a more complex runtime environment. It's got a lot more maths programming, a lot more libraries, a lot more accuracy. It has a runtime library, like a little small C library that translate. It, you, you, so if you call sign, it 
does a bunch of maths, but you don't want to write that in a low-level thing. You want to write that in a high-level language and translate it. So there's this little sub-library called libclc that does that. But that didn't have a spear v backend, so we needed to write a spear v backend so we could use the output of that library in our code. So that, this, was, this was on plan. This was going the direction we wanted it. It's like I can get my TensorFlow running on this if we can get it going. But then I fell down a little diversion. So if your goal is to do work on a GPU, why would you want to work on a CPU first? So LLVM pipe is a piece of code in Mesa that runs the software renderer through LLVM. So it's, 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 it's a, an attempt at making graphics rendering on a CPU be in some way acceptable. It succeeds before 4K monitors, it was sort of okay. 4K is kind of a bit messy. But LLVM pipe takes Mesa's internal IR, which at the time was an old one, and converts it into a runtime LLVM that sort of looks like it, it uses SIMD, it does all these kind of, you know, cool, fe you know, cool features that make it a lot more acceptable than basic level. So I was like, well, if I could make LLVM pipe take near, I could at least CI all of the rest of the stack up to that point, and that would bring the CI line down into Mesa, passed through the Spear V and the near, we would have a lot of, it would cover a lot more work. So I went, okay, well, I'll look into doing near support for LLVM pipe. So that was like, here goes one little diversion of my, my mother. It's like, okay, that, that, this isn't too bad. It's, you know, we just have to rip out the guts of this, make it use a different path. And then, but then I have to go, well, if I do that, I need to make it work for OpenGL. Because LLVM pipe is mostly being used currently for OpenGL, so I can't go ripping something, rewriting it, and then, failing all the tests again, and we'd just gotten CI for OpenGL working, so every time I, if I did that, someone would just, you know, reverted it. So I was like, well, I better make sure it passes all the OpenGL tests, which is quite a lot of tests. Took a, took a fair bit of time just dealing with the OpenGL side of things. And then I kind of sort of edged back a bit. I was like, okay, I got that working, got it pushed in, someone reviewed it. And then I started adding Clover support for LLVM, which was a bit more back on point for what I wanted. I wanted to have OpenCL on top of LLVM pipe so I can get my CI and get my testing working. And that wasn't that hard. The, the amount of code that needed to support the current state of Clover wasn't that hard. I was still waiting for the other guy to fix the flow control problem, so I was like, oh, I'm kind of stalled on him doing the flow control thing. I'll just wait. So I took another little diversion. I decided that for some reason I would like to have an LLVM pipe that supports Vulkan. That I would like to have a Vulkan software renderer that we don't have yet, except Swift, I Google released Swift Shader about two months ago that did this. And maybe it was a bit of that that annoyed me, I don't know. Or I, I maybe because I had a GSOC project about two years ago to do this and he never quite finished it. And I just sort of like, oh, well, I actually have built a, a lot more of the pieces of this problem now because I've gotten near and that brings in Vulkan. It's like, this should only take a week or two, it'll be fine. <laughs> Remember I said earlier Vulkan has a really good policy on conformance testing? Turns out it has. It has 72,000 tests. <laughs> That's a lot of tests. <laughs> Granted, when you fix something, you fix like a thousand of them, but it's still quite a lot of tests. Um, I'm currently sort of circling down the drain pipe of the last like 400 tests and breaking them and fixing them and breaking them and fixing them. Um, but I'm hoping that I will have a competent Vulkan implementation of LVM pipe within, like, it, it, it runs all the demos. It, I haven't gotten it to run any actual games, but I've talked to people, the Swift shader people at Google, and they said they haven't gotten to run any games either, so I'm like, okay, running games is really hard, because it's such a low-level API, games make a lot of assumptions that are very particular to graphics cards, and when you run on a CPU, those assumptions don't hold, so we'll see how it goes, but I'm gonna get it to pass conformance, because that's when you can call something Vulkan is once you've passed the tests, and before that, I can't really call it that. So I also did this in a kind of a unique fashion, because if you're writing a Vulkan software rasterizer, you could just write a Vulkan software rasterizer, or you could take the fact that you had that gallium abstraction I mentioned earlier that you can't put Vulkan on top of because it's a really bad idea, and just put Vulkan on top of it and claim it was a good idea. I did that. It was. It is a good idea. It only makes sense if you're dealing with software rendering. If you're dealing with the CPU, because all of your CPU time when you're dealing with software rendering 
is doing rasterizing and running particular shaders. It's not in the compiling, it's not in the state tracking, it's all in just drawing stuff on the screen. So even if you use f two or three point percent CPU there, it's got even going to be a drop in the ocean compared to how much CPU you need to just draw stuff on the screen. Um, people have already gone, oh, can I use this to not have to write a Vulkan driver for my hardware? And I've been, no. It, it, like Vulkan has a very complex set of barriers and pipeline system, and all I do is call flush for every one of those. It's like, it's a, you know, it's not the right, but for a software it seems like this could work. It was kind of turned out to be a bit fortuitous that I actually started working on this because then when level zero came out, I was forced with a, how would I do level zero for Mesa? And I haven't, this is my left leaving the, you know, ending question. Should I go with my idea of making a Vulkan extension that adds all of the compute features that level zero needs and then just building a level zero shim on top of that? Because I don't really like level zero as the long term answer to this problem. I don't like OpenCL as the answer. But if we want to get Vulkan tier, we need to have a path. And that by building Vulkan extensions that are very specific to Mesa, but leveraging the work that Intel are putting into level zero on top, we would then get execution environment that we could run on our Vulkan backends for Intel, AMD, LVM pipe, and eventually Nouveau, the NVIDIA backend, which was come along. But also it would help the ARM driver guys, which like Panfrost and yeah, maybe just Panfrost, and, uh, there's not too many that can actually run Vulkan 1.1, but th those other backends are ARM chips that are coming along. So this is where I'm kind of at at the moment. It's like level zero sample implementation hasn't been released yet. I've started hacking a little sample implementation of my own that just sort of, you know, just does the API and starts hooking it up to Vulkan in as many places as possible. It was also really valuable as like a, you know, reading a spec like level zero and implementing expect like level zero are very different things. You could read it and review it and say, this seems like a fine API. But when you actually start implementing it on top of something else, you realize, why the hell did you do this? Or why is that there? Why didn't you do it this way? Or did you not read the other specs before you wrote this crap? And then you sort of devolves. <laughs> so um, hopefully when they open source it, I'll be able to get out, and, out in front of it and be able to sort of provide them more direct feedback in the sense of, you know, this is good, this is bad. Uh, I think this is a good way of learning about that. So yeah, going forward, I'm not really sure what's going to happen in this space. I really would like to be come, back, come back next year and say, hey, look, TensorFlow on the GPU and just walk off. But uh, let's see. It may. Uh, maybe we propose a new Vulkan APIs. I don't know. Yeah, like one that doesn't require graphics cube. Maybe OpenCL will suddenly uh, reboot and come up with an API that people want to use. Don't know. So yeah, with that, I'm, I would like to say I have a demo, but really, uh, no. <laughs> So, uh, any questions? Uh, if you want to come down the front, and we have a couple of minutes for some questions. So just head down here to the mic if you have any. Saved. Yeah. Nope. Cool. We can go. Any questions? Break early. All right. Thank you. <laughs> cool.